Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you're located. It's Phil and we meet again. And this time it's not just me. I brought in the big guns to answer your questions concerning DTSX, DTSX Pro, as well as IMAX Enhance. So joining me is um, first uh, Nate Brown. Nate and I go back about a couple of years now when we talk um, dealing with the introduction of IMAX Enhance. And Nate is the product manager for DTS Home Audio. Um, this is his baby. And also we brought in the big brain to answer those questions that we can't answer. And that is Glenn Stone. Glenn Stone is a VP of engineering for systems architecture home. Basically he makes sure that it sounds great in your home. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna spend this hour talking about DTS, DTSX, DTSX Pro, and IMAX Enhanced. So let's talk about DTS. So Glenn, Nate, how are you guys doing today? We're good. Uh, cruising, cruising. Cruising. Now the funny <laughs> thing is, Nate, why, where are you and why are you there? <laughs> I know, people are probably wondering what this nice man is doing in his automobile. Uh, yeah, so I live in a very small house in Santa Barbara, California. And during the, uh, the these times of COVID-19, we had a little bit of a work from home collision, my wife and I. So <laughs> I volunteered. I figured we can talk DTS and, and uh, Denon and Morantz from anywhere. So I told her I'd be the one to seclude myself in the car down in the garage. So yes. hey there. <laughs> yes. So he is he is taking a WebEx or a webinar from his Tesla. Can you imagine the wonders <laughs> I got of modern, yeah. modern technology? Glenn looks very comfortable in his in his uh, den living room. And I am back in front of my in front of my gear. So, like I said, one th reason why we wanted to bring this up is uh, Denon has always been a leader when it comes to the latest in surround sound formats, and we've always been one of the first to introduce new formats. And um, and DTS X and DTS X Pro is another example of that. So, as we uh, as we mentioned before, the new 6700 as well as the uh, 8500 and the Marantz. Um, AV8805 um, will support DTS-X Pro um, this year. Um, the um, the 8500 and the 8805 are going to get it via a firmware update later in the year. And before you ask, it's those two models, the flagship models. We would love to do the models below, but there's limitations to processing channel count and things like that, that it's limited for this year's models to upgrading the 8500 and the 8805, um, and of course the 6700. Now DTSX Pro has been around on a couple of really high-end pieces um, for about a year, but but those pieces are very expensive pre-pros that cost about the same as a small BMW. Now you'll be able to get into DTSX Pro in a receiver at prices starting at about 2,500 US. So it becomes something that becomes a lot more approachable. And I remember the first time I actually got into DTS was I was a retail guy and 20 years ago and the first demos we did were, um, uh, I think it was like Jurassic, was it Jurassic Park? It was some movie like that. Uh, the main one I remember was Eagles Hotel, the Eagles Hotel California <laughs> and um, and uh, Emerson Lake and Palmer Lucky Man, Discrete's audio and the quality of, of DTS. So as we start talking about these formats, including even IMAX Enhance, quality has always been kind of the part of your history. So can you kind of talk about the history of the company? And um, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And I, I actually, uh, if I may, I'd like to brag just a little bit. Um, you know, we're in this world today where everybody, uh, nearly everybody seems to be talking about high resolution audio and music. Uh, mm -hmm. And what people may not know is that DTS had a music label um, uh, many years ago, and we have we were doing high resolution audio music titles. Uh, I remember actually the first one that I got was a Blue Man Group disc, mm -hmm. uh, and man, it was sweet. Uh, it was it, it just sounded phenomenal. Um, so we we've been doing essentially high resolution audio for for many many years. We got our start back in 1993. Um, uh, Steven Spielberg uh, was putting together a, a little movie called Jurassic Park. And uh, his, you know, the the visual effects were were uh, very tightly controlled. Nobody was talking about it, right? He didn't want people to see it before it happened. Uh, but he knew that he needed an audio technology to accompany the film that was essentially on par with the the visual effects and all the breakthroughs he was doing there. 
And so um, uh, we had some unique technology that instead of having our audio track on the film strip, uh, instead we had our audio track on a separate optical disc. So there was actually a Jurassic Park optical disc uh, that sat alongside the projector. And on the film strip, instead of audio, was actually time code which then synced with the with the optical disc. And we got for for really the first time, we got 5.1 digital surround in movie theaters. And I actually, believe it or not, remember that I, I skipped school. I stood in line to watch Jurassic Park when it hit the movie theaters. And um, and I remember that opening animation and my mind was blown uh, what that what that theater recreated. And um, and that really kicked it off. And from there, we moved into the home in 1996. We became part of the Blu-ray standard. A number of years later with DTS HD Master Audio, we released DTSX in 2015, and now I'm Max Enhanced and DTSX Pro. Now, one of the questions we always get, Glenn, is we have this new technology coming, um, and the first question I always ask is, am I going to have to buy new content? Because this, am I, this is going to be the ninth time that I buy Star Wars because now there's a new format. What's the deal? Um, can I utilize what I already have? Yeah, <laughs> in fact, <laughs> all our, all our uh, the progression of our technologies from original days way back at with digital surround is both backwards compatible, meaning that if you only have an old digital surround AVR today and you play DTSX uh, content Blu-ray, it'll play back on that AVR. And the same is now going forward. If you have DTSX content today, and uh, you get a DTSX Pro AVR, which and you kit it out, which means you get to add more speakers than than um, what you used to be able to do with DTSX. Mm -hmm. Those speakers are utilized. Um, the neural upmix engine will use those speakers. You'll get a much smoother panning by using those speakers. So it's not like there's new content. It's mm -hmm. just that taking the existing content, both channel-based and object-based, it'll render to those speakers in a seamless fashion to give you a much smoother sound field as things fly by you or drive by you. Okay. Okay. So I can take my old content and it's going to make my old content better. And the current content that I bought that has DTSX on the logo on the box, is just going to get better as well. Um, there is no new content It's just being um, the, con the existing DTS content that's available on market today. And in the past is going to get better. Right. Nate, he's kind of chilling it, yeah. in his car. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just taking it. Uh, so, no, you're absolutely right. That's one of the that's one of the things we want to make sure we we communicate very clearly. Uh, we don't want people to to worry that they're they need to find you know the disc in in their their local store that has a DTSX Pro logo on it. That won't exist. It's really DTSX. So you just seek out your favorite DTSX content, or to Glenn's point, any other DTS content that you might have in your in your old library of DVDs. And your DTSX and DTSX Pro uh, AVRs or processors, they'll play that back and they'll make the most of that content on the speaker layout that you have in your home. Okay. And and also um, DTSX Pro, like DTSX, is an uh, utilizes as an object-based surround sound format. And a lot of times the older formats were channel-based. So um, an object-based gives you a lot more um, flexibility and capabilities. So, for example, we've all seen like the surround channels that are at at ear level. Um, those channels still exist, even when you have a object based um, surround sound format, but they call it, I think, the bed layer. They always have these fancy names for things. And these little speakers that give you the sounds around the horizon. And normally, whenever they added another channel to this, you got another format. So it went from ProLogic the 5.1, the 7.1, to 9.1. And that's pretty much how they did it. And what they did is they took all of those, if you've ever been to a, um, a, um, a studio, I used to work for a company that had a studio, and most of the sounds that come out that happen in those movies are done on what's called a Foley stage. It's two old ladies with banging on pans, making it sound like it's thunder and lightning. And then they take all of those sounds, put on a big old mixing board, and then assign those hundreds and hundreds of sounds used to to be like seven or eight channels. Now they could do more. They can assign it to um, as objects. So I could put them in that in that traditional surround channels, but I can also assign them as objects. So um, Glenn, can you talk about what an object is and and why you know what is how does it work and how is it backwards compatible and and all of that stuff? 
Sure. So what you were basically describing at the beginning there is what, what you normally would call as channel-based audio, where um, each speaker, think of that as a channel, and the mix is made to go out on channels. Mm -hmm. Objects are a little bit different. Um, the way objects are is they have, a, they're, they're like a, a sound with a mathematical formula that calculates where you want to hear that sound from, mm -hmm. and then the, the object will, within the internal process in the AVR, render to the speakers that'll make it sound like it's coming right from some point in space. So if you have a bee flying around, every, every frame, every audio frame, it's recalculating where that bee should be and then, and then figuring out which speakers to triangulate in on to move that around. So what mm -hmm. that gives you is, yes, while you might have 11 channels if you have a 7.1.4 system, um, but an object, it doesn't care about channels. It's just going to utilize speakers wherever they are to get the pinpoint accuracy in space of where that thing is supposed to be. Uh, an interesting object might be an airplane flying over your head. Um, that's a really interesting object for a couple of reasons, because when it's flying towards you, the sound of the airplane is somewhat different than when it flies away due to the Doppler effect. So the mixing engineer will use a, a, a tool to grab the airplane and pinpoint how he wants it to fly, if it's going to fly straight over your head or if it's going to go to the side. Um, and he might actually change out the airplane object for a different airplane object of one that's flying away, so you get the, the flying away sound from the Doppler effect. Mm -hmm. So when, when you're sitting there, you don't realize this. What you hear is a nice seamless airplane flying over your head, but that's actually an object that's being rendered on every frame to be pinpoint. So I'm doing, now I'm sort of saying it's going diagonal, so that's a good way to really pinpoint how it's just changing position. So that's what yeah. objects, you can have lots of objects. Sometimes the, they, won't, they won't mix all the objects because they don't want to complicate the soundtrack and they'll just move them into the channels. Um, mm -hmm. But they always start out with lots of objects, the mixers, and then it's up to them how they want to finally set the mix up that's going to be delivered on Blu-ray disc or via streaming. Okay. Yeah, so they make that bed layer with a surround objects in your traditional surround sound. Then they take objects and they assign it. I always say metadata. You know, where is it located? How big is it? How loud is it? How diffuse is it? And then all the receiver does is take that metadata, look at how many speakers it has to make that sound end up where it's supposed to be. And um, and that's what this little this little cube looks like. This is actually kind of like the kind of tools they use. Now this is a Adobe um, one for Adobe Atmos, but the premise of the for the for DTS is and DTSX is about the same. That top ones that are highlighted in purple that you see are the are basically that bed layer um that layer of of uh of sounds that are um that are make make up your traditional 9.1 7.1 surround sound and then the art the, the engineer has a ton of different objects he can use hundreds if you want over 100 if he wants to but a lot of times like you said he may not use all of them because it may it just makes it too busy he just picks the ones for impact, just like your LFE is not always booming and banging, LFE is just there to enhance your bass. So the objects are there to enhance your surround sound format. So that's the stuff that's on the left. In the middle, um, that is the uh, basically the layout of the room that he's using. And then over here is kind of the little cube you see is actually the um, where those objects that he had assigned, where they're going to be located in space. And it's really cool. To see these guys, literally, it's like a joystick, and they're like playing like a, it's almost like a like a sound video game that these guys are actually playing to put the sounds in and put them where they want them to be. So, so I think it's um so that's pretty much the premise of how this these three parts work, right, Glenn? You have your objects, yeah, yeah. your room, oh, yeah. and your space. Right. So what what's important to understand is the middle picture. That's the layout the mixing engineers work to. Now, not everybody's layout is going to look like that. And that's the key thing about objects and whatnot, because they can recalculate based on your speaker layout when you enter it into the, you know, on your Denon or, or Marantz, you enter here if you've got tops or heights, and then you run Odyssey to get um, the distances and, and, the, and the tone matching and the, and the EQ. That's all perfect, because then objects make use of that information so that they can render them in precise locations for you. Yeah. The, the best way to think of it, too, is when a guy went back in the days when they were mixing channels, if they were going to mix a 7.1 mix, they needed a 7.1 system. If they were going to mix a 9.1 mix, they needed a 9.1 system. 
I could take this 7.1.4 and that because I'm just I'm just using it as a reference in my theater. I want that object to be over there. It that same object can be translated on a 30.2 system. Because yes, I'm not, yes. it's not based on the on how many channels were in the mixing room, which is what makes it different um, than how they it's used really, to do it. Really good point. It's a really good point. So if you have more speakers, it'll have a better chance of being more precise as to where that object would be. Yeah. You also mentioned, and like I said, so if we continue on here, um, oh, I'll take off my highlighter. I got I got used to all my little drawing tools in here. So like we were talking up about before, that object. It looks at what you have in your room, 7.1.4, um, uh, 5.1.4, 9.1.4, um, uh, 7.1.6 or whatever, and determines how to utilize those speakers to put the object in your room. Now, Glenn, you mentioned, we were talking about it yesterday that um, there's a benefit to having more speakers when it comes to the sweet spot of the in the listening room. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So... When, when you're, um, you know, everybody sort of talks about, there's this, this thing called the sweet spot. And the idea is, you know, where are you sitting? And uh, then you're directing the sound towards that spot. And so if you're not exactly sitting in that spot, you might get some, some imaging differences. And one of the ways you, you solve that is by having more speakers so you can be more precise. So for example, um, remember we said, so you can take a DTSX mix but if you have a DTSX Pro AVR and you do hook up those extra speakers, you're gonna you're gonna reduce the emphasis of the sweet spot now and make it a little bit better for other people. So if you have two rows of seating, for example, and you run, you know, six six tops um, instead of four tops, now when the sound goes, you know, the sweet spot would have been in the middle, but now you can be a little bit forward, a little bit back because you've got six speakers, and so you can you can take advantage of these extra speakers. The decoders will take advantage of these extra speakers to drive them in a seamless fashion. So your sweet spot isn't as, as, as narrow as it used to be. So now you can have yeah. a home theater with multiple rows, kind of like when you go to the theater, which have lots of speakers, if you remember. Yeah, and that's one of the things that uh, Jim, who's up on the line with me, when I first came over uh, and joined the Sinaida family, he was a stickler about putting as many speakers as he possibly can in every demo room. And I was like, do we have to lug around like, six or seven BP towers and he's like yep because he knew that he that um, if I had multiple you know, like a 7.1.6 that the, I was going to get a more um, and we had multiple rows of seats in the demo rooms um, all of the seats were going to sound better so the more channels we could put in a room the wider the speech the sweet spot would be and the better the experience was going to be and it worked out it worked out pretty well um Nice thing for Nate. He only, now this technology is going to live for a long time. His Tesla will fly by the time you have to come up with another, um, <laughs> hopefully, surround sound format um, that we have to deal with. So um, uh, some more things we want to talk about here. Oh, come on, my little thing is we have all these different um, uh, speakers that you can put into a room. So in order to do it, normally you have your bed layer of speakers, you know, around this for the surround. And then you also have to have some sort of height-based speaker. And that height-based speaker could be an end ceiling or a on-wall or a speaker that, like a height-enabled speaker that bounces off of the ceiling. But there are times where customers cannot do that. And DTS has a solution. So Nate, do you want to talk about their wonderful solution that you guys have available with, their, with your virtual technology? I do. And today I knew where you were going with that. <laughs> Excellent lead in. Uh, yes, yeah, so we actually, we worked with, uh, we worked with, with you and, and your colleagues over at, at Sound United, the Ben and Morant side specifically, uh, a number of years ago now. So, um, in fact, I think it was actually a conversation uh, that we were having at some point where we learned that, you know, you informed us, hey, you know, we have a lot of customers that are high end, they're putting, you know, a multi-speaker systems with with height and their and their custom theaters in their home and that's great but we also have uh, a percentage of our of our customers who are who are not installing height speakers right you told us that um they are maybe just setting up uh whether it's temporarily or permanently maybe just a 5.1 or a 7.1 um and the question was you know what what might we be able to do about that and we have a a, a division of our company that specializes in um, in 
what is basically psychoacoustics. So it's 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 really it's the the it's it's working with the principles of how the how humans respond both physiologically and psychologically to sound, right? So I often will ponder this question. We hear something behind us and we know it's behind us. But if you really stop to question how it is that our minds know that that sound is coming from behind us, it's pretty trippy. And there's there's mechanical things going on, has to do with the shape of the ears and all that kind of stuff. But there's also um, there's also stuff going on in the mind that's how we interpret sounds. And if you, in essence, reverse engineer that, you can do some really cool stuff, right? We can do some audio post-processing to the, to the DTS bitstream in this case that gives the user the sensation of surround or the sensation of height when there aren't really speakers there. So DTS Virtual X enables us to get the sensation of sound behind us, uh, beside us, above us, when we might only have a pair of speakers or three speakers installed at the front of our room. Or maybe we have a 5.1 system. And, and so we've got what we would call discrete surround, but we want to create a virtual height and Virtual X can do that. So Virtual X takes the output of the DTS decoder, whether that's uh, a DTS digital surround decoder or a DTS X decoder. It takes the output as PCM, brings that into the spatial processing engine within Virtual X, and then it works all of its magic that's based on those psychoacoustic principles. And we can really take any PCM. So it doesn't matter where we get that PCM. So Virtual X can apply not only to DTS content, but to to, to really any Game content systems, you're feeding through our Apple TV, um, all a lot of a lot of different things you can utilize it with. And Just I will feed tell it you into that your system. Exactly. Um, uh, one thing I, I we were talking about yesterday was, you know, before I did this, my first job out of high school was I was a I was in the military for 10 years and I was a submarine sonar tech. So if you guys ever seen the hunt for Red October, the guy going con sonar, you know, uh, contact 5000 yards, that's what I actually did for for 10 years. And there are no windows on a submarine. So everything uh, we could tell if something's in front of us, behind us, above us, below us. Ba all solely based on what it sounds like. So the science is is valid because that's how submarines shoot torpedoes at things. So it works really, 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 really well. So um, now let's really now there, there's some differences between uh, DTS X and DTS X Pro, and the main one of the main differences is the um, the speaker configuration. So if I go back, if I go here, um, the DTS X which was found on a lot of our older on older AVRs um, was limited to 11.1. Had nothing to do with the content. Like I said, the content doesn't think in channels. It was just the processors um, and the receivers could take that object and render it using up to 11 speakers. Now you have up to 30 speakers or 30 positions that you can utilize. Um, now, are we going to be making a um, a a uh, 30 channel receiver. No, we're not making a 30 channel receiver this year. Um, but you know, some maniac may in the in the in the long uh, in the future decide that they want 30 channels and some super high end piece um, that this content will live on. Now there are a couple of unique uh, channels to this too. You have your top height and your um, your your top surround and your center front height speaker which are unique um, to DTS X Pro that is not on uh, DTS standard DTS X. Now when the content comes in um, it, the receiver does a lot of little trickery with it and, uh, and Glenn do you want to talk about this uh, what's going on and how do you, the decoders and the renderers and the up mixers work <laughs> together to give you a good, good sound? Yeah so can you hear me I changed my microphone Yes, we can, sir. Yeah, we got you. Right. And Phil, do you have that? Do you have that slide, Phil, that shows the uh, the uh, the neural X and the object renderer? I think yeah, that's a good yeah. we're going to talk yeah, about that, that one. So let's talk about our traditional. Um, let's even talk about a, a five or seven dot one sound uh, movie today that you have. So we're going to talk about this. You know, um, going moving forward, you don't need new content. So that's that's a channel-based mix, meaning it expects uh, if it's a 7.1 master audio Blu-ray disc, it expects there to be seven speakers, and if you only had five, it gets down mixed to those. Um, 
now you add some height speakers. So say you've got a DTSX AVR and you had those height speakers. Well, if you probably went to a lot of work like I did to put those height speakers and you want them active. So we have a, a technology called Neural X, which does a lot of interesting predictive processing to figure out what it's supposed to move to those height speakers. So what's really cool is Neuralex, a lot of people will turn Neuralex on by default for their 5.1 movies because they like the immersive effect that they get from it. And it, it's very interesting because it calculates velocities of, of sounds to figure out what to move up to the top and stuff. So it's pretty cool. Um, now, if you have objects, those objects do to go wherever they're supposed to go on your, say, your 7.1.4 or 7.2, meaning two subwoofers, because I was like two subwoofers. Um, those, those know where to go on using any of the speakers. And so now you go to DTSX Pro, and you've added more speakers. So you would expect you get to use those speakers, and you do. The neural up mixer has been adjusted to allow to go to all the speakers supported by the DTSX Pro layout, and in the case of the, the Denon and, and Marantz AVRs, that'll be 13 speakers and, and two LFE channels. Um, so normal channel mix music will be up mixed by, by Neural X to use those speakers. And if there's objects, the objects will use whatever speakers are there. So you see, objects don't care about channels. They just care about position and space and what speakers are available to get that position, which is kind of cool. So, um, you will have a better experience with a DTSX Pro system on legacy content than you will on just a DTSX system if you put on more speakers. Okay, yeah. And um, and like I said, more more speakers means it's easier for that object to appear where you want it to be, and it will make all of your content more immersive. Now, um, now of course, we have, like a lot of times, you can do a lot because the new receivers that we're offering, um, the uh, 6700 with an external amplifier, the, the AV8805 and the Denon X8500 can support 13 channels of processing or 13 speakers. And there's a variety of, uh, of configurations. The, some of the configurations you're probably familiar with, the traditional 7.1.6, which has seven surround speakers and four heights and two top middle heights. So basically seven on the floor and six on the ceiling or six on the walls. Now, you're also, we can do 9.1.4, which is what, you know, so you can have nine which um, speakers on the floor using the, or on the, on the surround speakers, including uh, a front, um, a left front wide and a right front wide. And then you can also have your heights. New for this year um, with DTSX Pro is, a, is another 7.1.6 um, configuration, which is, um, includes four heights plus a top surround and her front height. So these are, this is kind of unique. Now that top surround and center front height also has other benefits as well. You mentioned that PCM can be converted. So does that mean PCM from any source, even a Dolby source, <laughs> would be converted by Virtual X or Neural X? And I know you that- Many, many people like to do neural X for their taking a non-immersive audio track and turning it immersive because it functions better. But then I also recall hearing something about Dolby is poo-pooing that. So do you know where that's at? Yes, yeah, so the, those days are behind us, the poo-pooing. Those days are behind us. Uh, so there is there, there are no there are no restrictions there. Up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, DTS uh, Neural X and Virtual X can both accept PCM from any source, uh, including, yes, Dolby decoded content. And I think one of the important points here, and this is something that, that all of us on this, this webinar share, is that the power of choice is a good thing, right? And mm -hmm. so uh, Denon and Marantz, they want to build uh, AVRs and processors that can, can do whatever the customer needs to do, right? So if somebody mm -hmm. prefers the Neural X up mixer, the Neural X up mixer is available to all content coming into that AVR. If somebody prefers, uh, has a 5.1 setup, but they want Virtual X to elevate that, sort of give that sensation of height, uh, then that is available to any content or any source on that AVR. And then Phil, just tell me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. 
No, you're right. Okay, good. I'm not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there because Dolby did for a second say you couldn't use any up mixer but theirs, but there was so much backlash from uh, viewers like you guys out there about it that we convinced them that a, along with DTS that um, let the customer choose what they want to use and um, and let everybody be happy. Now, the uh, any other questions, Jim? Hey, Frederick, you want to throw uh, this one out there? Yeah, this is uh, a question from Shankar. Shankar, um, um, is it more speakers or discrete, more channel? Which one is better for object-based sound? Uh, so it, it, if I'm understanding the question, um, I'll just speak to what, what we do on the DTS side. So DTS X content won't change. So if it's, if it's channel-based content, it's going to be 11.1. And then of course we can layer on top of that channel-based mix. We can layer objects as the, well, I'd say we, but it's really the, the, the creatives, the people behind the films that are making these things, the audio mixer, the director and such. Mm -hmm. uh, they can opt to leverage objects and, and layer those onto the channel-based mix. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to reproducing that sound in the home with DTSX or DTSX Pro, it's really, to Glenn's point earlier, it's about adding as many speaker locations as we can possibly get away with, because mm -hmm. the more spatial resolution we have, mm -hmm. the more accurate, true-to-life reproduction of the content that's on that on that disc or, or however we're getting it. Now, the other thing you have to think about, too, is you were talking about speakers versus discrete, or so speakers versus discrete. If I took four speakers and connected them all to the right rear surround, um, the receiver doesn't really have control over each of those speakers to physically put an object someplace. So each speaker is connected to a discrete channel that the, the receiver knows about so it can make an object. So we're not just, so, so each, um, it's so, yeah, so as we add these speakers, you would need 32, if I did 30.2, you would need 30 channels of amplification and 30 unique speakers. I couldn't connect speakers to 10 channels and get the same effect so each channel is discrete and the more discrete channels you have the better the receiver can look at how many channels it has and pick the right channels to make an object appear like exactly yeah right. you know what's interesting we you've just this question pointed out a little bit of a problem in the industry of the definition of a channel because you're right you need a speaker needs for if we want to get physical, a wire connected to an amplifier to be driven. But say you take, um, see if this helps drive this home. So if you take DTSX Pro and you fully kit it out with a 13 speakers, um, and then you get a DTSX 11, you know, 11, 7.1.4, 11 channel mix. What that means is there's there's sound allocated to 11 speakers. And that's your traditional 7.1 to 4 layout. And then if you have Neural X turned on, you will actually use your other speakers. And mm -hmm. or if you have objects in the mix, so as Nate said, if the creatives put some objects in there, then those objects don't care about those original 11 connections. They mm -hmm. care about some number of connections to make that sound pop where it should. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're right. You know, it's when we think about it, we say, well, it's 13 channels of physical connections. But I'm not sure if the question was talking was trying to figure out channels of audio versus objects using yeah. those speakers. And I don't know if so I've even way, helped or not. So but. the best way to think of it is like, we're, and we'll bring it up again a little later. Say I want it to be Godzilla and he's screaming. He, I want him to be 10 feet tall, and I want his voice to come from above the screen 10 feet up. OK, now the one way I could do that is I could take my um, my center channel and my two height and my left and front heights. And I can if I put the signal theoretically uh, between those speakers, I can make a phantom image of Godzilla screaming from you. Um, does a pretty good job. But if I have more speakers and I physically put a speaker there, the receiver will say, oh, there's a speaker exactly where Godzilla's voice is supposed to be. I'll just use that one. And instead of it being a phantom image, it becomes a actual channel. It's just like if I take surround sound and I disconnect my center channel, if I set my speakers up properly, the voice will still come from the center. It just won't be as defined and as distinct as if there's a physical speaker there. So 
Um, that's just that's one way to think of it. Now, um, before we move on, hey, Phil, I have a yes. There is one other, and Glenn, correct me if I'm wrong. There is one other benefit to having that discrete speaker in that location, where yes, you can do it phantomly until you go off access. Exactly. As soon as you get right. off access, then your the the phantom image vanishes and drifts to one side or the other, and now things aren't where they're supposed to be. Exactly, exactly. and that's what Phil almost said too. And, and the best example is if you take stereo speakers and you have a center channel mix, meaning the voice should come from the center. If you're sitting right in yeah. the middle of those two mm -hmm. center stereo speakers, it'll sound like it. If you move to the left or the right, it's gonna move on you. But if you have yeah. a center speaker, you can sit anywhere on the couch and you'll see it coming, exactly. it coming from the center. And that comes back to Glenn's conversation about more speakers gives you a wider sweet spot. Because I have more, I yep. can better define an object and where it's located if I have more speakers there that I can utilize, it makes the sweet spot bigger. Now. Before we before we move on uh, and start talking about configurations and how you connect it and all that stuff, the question I have for Nate: Where's the content? How come there's more content when it when I'm looking at like uh, Atmos than when I see on DTS? Are you gonna have more content? Where am I gonna get more content? Content, content, content. What's the deal? I know what man? you're doing, Phil. I know what you're doing. You're trying to <laughs> squeeze information out of me. <laughs> on behalf of your uh, your your participants out there, uh, so so yeah, um, I, I think we'd all agree. Certainly, Glenn and I that we'd love to see more DTS content uh, out mm -hmm. there in the world, and there is more content coming. And mm -hmm. and one of the ways in which uh, our content is is coming into your homes uh, out there is through IMAX Enhanced. Uh, I think we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later, and maybe even do a dedicated webinar to IMAX Enhanced if we can pull it off. Yes, we are going to talk um, about that. <laughs> but but I think I think the point that everybody should really understand is um, is it, it's it's not as it's not as straightforward as as DTS uh, rolling up to to the creatives of the studios and saying you should put that movie out on disc right with with DTS content on it. As you can imagine, there's a lot of negotiations involved. There's a, a lot of nuances. Um, and so we've we've done some work. Uh, we have some exciting announcements later this year and into next year. Things that Phil's trying to squeeze out of me and I can't talk about yet. <laughs> um, but but the moral of the story is there. Uh, we have I think right now we've had over 250 cinema releases in DTSX, and and I think we're pushing like 130, 140, 150. Uh, 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray disc releases, somewhere around that number, or maybe that also includes Blu-ray discs. Um, and then with IMAX Enhanced, we've got uh, 40 titles already in the world, out there in the world today, or more than 40. And then, you know, Sony Pictures just announced, what, a couple of weeks ago, that they're bringing over 100 titles, yeah. uh, IMAX Enhanced titles, to, to market in the coming 12 months. Uh, and then, like I said, we'll have other things to talk about later this year and into next year. So um, uh, we we hear you. We we love that you're eager to get your hands on it. We're eager to get it out there. Uh, we're actively working with the studios and the creatives to make that happen. And we've got some exciting things coming. Yeah, yeah. Because I've been poking the bear about uh about streaming content. So he knows. He knows. And they know. Yeah. So I'll tell you what I, I got delivered today was that new um, the new to my home was the new uh -huh. uh, the Best Buy Steelbook release of Gladiator uh -huh. uh, four, oh, 4K. That's with, uh, yeah, so that's pretty sweet. I'm looking forward to the uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's one one fight scene in particular. You know the one I'm talking about. That's that's yes, pretty yes. slick. So yeah, and uh, and uh, hey. the other thing, too, yeah, go ahead, Jim. Oh, sorry, but I just I just want to ask a follow up question. Those hundred movies in IMAX Enhanced that Sony's going to deliver this year or in the well, not, not, I don't think they'll all be this year they're yeah they'll upcoming be upcoming okay. and yeah so there are going to be new movies and they're doing back catalog I guess well how my question is are they coming on disc or is it going to be nothing but streaming that's actually a great question Jim I don't have an answer for you um, yeah. yeah we'll figure that out Mm -hmm. Yes, because they, because Sony does have. If you have a, and we'll talk about the how you, yeah. um, the importance of eARC. That seems that's only HDMI technology we're going to really wrap about today. 
um, because for things such as IMAX Enhanced, because Sony has like an app in their TV called Privilege, which allows them to do uh, IMAX um, from uh, enhanced content from a streaming a streaming service. Can we stay mm -hmm. where we are just for a second? Yes. Dewey just dropped, and again, if I'm saying your name wrong, I am so sorry, but he dropped yet another great question. Mm -hmm. You have a list of all your 4K and Blu-rays that have DTSX encoding inside somewhere that somebody could find. Yeah, do you have uh, like on well, your website? Uh, not on the website, but I'll tell you, um, there, there's a, a really generous group of people out there at blu-ray.com, blue-ray.com. Mm -hmm. And if you go in, uh, they have an advanced search function. Uh, it's over on the left-hand column. You can do an advanced search. And in that advanced search, uh, you can just type in DTSX in the, uh, in the audio track area. And that'll actually bring up just a flood of titles. You can sort them uh, by release date and, and however you want to take a look at them. So uh, we have nothing to do with that website, but it's a, it's a very cool resource to, to get your hands on. And you can, you can look at different formats. If you wanted to see what's out there and, you know, uh, and DTS HD Master Audio versus DTSX or anything else, you can do that. Yeah. It's blue-ray.com, correct? Yep. Yep. Yes. Yep. B-L-U-Ray. Yep. Yeah, and that's okay. yeah, and they'll tell you it, it's a it's a very good. It tells you aspect ratios, what format it's in, even if it's shot if it's shot in 4K, if it's mastered in 4K. It's really really cool. So IMAX Enhanced is actually another. We talk about when you go to a movie theater right now. Um, you'll see a variety of different theaters. Like if I go to an, uh, a theater in America, I could see one screen will be showing Avengers in Dolby Vision and, and Dolby Atmos. Another one will be doing it in DTS-X with a, um, ultra, with a wide screen aspect. And then there would be an IMAX presentation of that same movie. All three of those experiences are completely different. And a lot of times um, as a consumer, we only get, get one option. So an IMAX theater is going to be different. It is, it is a different beast. Um, number one, the speakers are gigantic, okay? Um, and because the whole thing, um, so they're big, they weigh a lot, they play full range, full range. Um, anybody, a lot of us think we have full range speakers. Most of us do not. These are full range speakers. And the layout is completely different. Um, and how they lay out the, the speakers, including their flagship theaters, which are a 12 channel system. And that 12 channel system uses this um, a, a 12.0. Can you talk, Nate, about this 12.0 and 6.0 and 5.0 thing that goes on with IMAX and with IMAX? Yeah, so in an IMAX cinema, in an IMAX cinema, uh, there, there is no LFE, to your point. These are full range speakers. <laughs> in essence, they don't need an LFE. Uh, they can handle all of the uh, all of the kick butt audio. Uh, if it's a if it's a big you know blockbuster title, it tends to be a 12.0 mix. Um, so it's very similar to an 11.1 mix in somebody's home, but the dot one is then folded into all the speakers basically. And the 12th channel is actually a center front height, which mm -hmm. there's some parallels there with DTSX Pro that we'll talk about. You so can, you can actually see right here in the drawing here. You yeah, there you this. go. That that. Yeah, that's, and that's that's the Godzilla speaker, right? That's the one that makes Godzilla <laughs> a thousand feet tall or what have you. Um, so the cinema mix would be 12.0 for a, for a, a blockbuster title, maybe 6.0 or 5.0 for uh, uh, the IMAX documentary titles like Space Station, which um, and many people have seen those IMAX documentary titles over the years. And, and um, IMAX Enhanced is the first time we've been able to bring those into the home. Uh, so anyway, when we bring that audio mix into the home, we do so with IMAX enhanced content that leverages exclusively DTS audio technologies. So the 12.0, we derive an LFE from that 12.0 mix. We give you an 11.1 presentation and we use an object to give you that center front height. So if you have that center front height speaker that's highlighted on that little, that little image to the left there, uh, DTS X Pro will make use of it. So it, that it, it'll it'll take that that discrete point in space that's on the IMAX enhanced content, and it'll stick it right there into that center front height speaker. So Godzilla really is a thousand feet tall. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, if you have more speakers than you know, if if, if you have thirteen dot one or thirteen dot two, like the X sixty seven hundred H or what have you mm -hmm. can do, 
Mm -hmm. um, and in the image on the right, it's illustrated with, with what we might call an overhead or a top surround. Uh, then neural X can be turned on and we can actually mm -hmm. then up mix to that speaker as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we didn't really give the backstory of, of what IMAX Enhanced is for those who may not be aware, but the short story is that IMAX Enhanced is about bringing the IMAX cinema experience into the home. That's an IMAX signature audio mix that, that we work with IMAX to reproduce um, for the home. That is pristine remastered HDR video content that often has a different aspect ratio that's taller. That was one of your points earlier, Phil. Mm -hmm. And then it's also about these exclusive titles. Um, it's a it's IMAX documentaries. It's versions of films that had a an IMAX release and then were never seen again. So it's literally uh, different versions of films that nobody has had on disc prior mm -hmm. to now. So IMAX Enhanced has some really cool benefits. And then when you couple it with DTSX Pro, it gets really cool. Yes. And then, um, so one thing we, as, uh, as Nate mentioned, our receivers, we have a 6700, 6, has 11 amplifiers and 13 channels of processing. Um, and then if you use a external amplifier, you can you you can drive 13 speakers. A 8500 um, has 13 amplifiers, 13 channels of processing, and 15 speaker terminals. And we'll talk about why that is a benefit in a second. Now, if you look, there's multiple configurations that you can actually utilize. So say you have you can do uh when you and a lot of times when we hear 7.1 or 7.2.6 we think of the more traditional dolby atmos configuration that we see uh, that we've seen over the last year or so which has front heights rear heights and top middles so they can be in the ceiling or they can be you know middle heights so basically six above and seven around us now that can that configuration can absolutely be used for dtsx pro and, um, you absolutely can use it. Or you can opt for a um, two front heights, two rear heights, a center front height, and a top surround, or as Aural 3D calls, the voice of God. So you can have the Dolby Atmos layout or a DTSX Pro slash IMAX Enhanced slash Aural 3D layout. If you have a 6700, you could choose between the two. Now, the question everybody asked is, especially guys on this call, is what if I want them both? What if I want the um, the full 7.1.6 with the mid top middles for Atmos, and then I want the center height and the top surround for for um, DTSX and IMAX Enhanced and Oral 3D? What can I do? Well, that's what makes the 8500 special. 13 amplifiers, 15 terminals. You would wire the middles, the top middles, and you have enough terminals to actually add the tops around and the center front height. And then you would go into the receiver's amplifier assign menu and switch them. Now, it takes a minute or so to do, but you can physically do it in the inside of the, of the receiver. So you could actually, if you wanted to have both, you can. Now, as I keep mentioning, if you go with the Atmos configuration, with the 7.1.6, with the with the traditional um, front heights, rear heights, and the middles, it's gonna sound spectacular on in DTSX and IMAX because that is part of their configuration as well. You're not you don't have to worry that if you pick the Atmos one, the DTSX one is not gonna sound is not gonna. Can sound I just amazing. follow on with a comment on that, just so everybody understands? Then yeah, so if you if you set it up that way, and then you've got that center fright center front height um, speaker that, that's no longer there. What you have is your two heights and your center channel. Well, that comes in as an object. So what'll mm -hmm. happen is it will be rendered as an object using those three speakers to triangulate to give you that center front height. So you still get your center front height. What was it, Godzilla? Um, yeah. You know, in exactly. that arrangement as well. Exactly. So, so, so yeah. fear so not. <laughs> so the center front height will always be used, and if you use, uh, if you go to the traditional um, uh, two pairs in the front, two pairs in the middle, two pairs in the rear, that will work as well. Now, a lot of times um, um, when we talk about positions, right? So there's um, DTSX Pro supports up to 30 positions. Um, 
uh, Atmos supports up to about 35 positions. If you look at the positions, they're very similar. So <laughs> if you lay out out for, for Atmos, it's going to sound just fine for DTSX. So you don't have to worry about people ask me that all the time. What, what happens if, you know, what's the best way? You know, set it up what's going to fit in your application. And both of these systems using Odyssey will figure out where your speakers are located. The receiver will talk, the, the receiver's DSP and um, process, Odyssey processor will talk to the receiver's rendering engine, and the sounds will come from where it's supposed to come from based on the information that Odyssey provided the renderer. So you're going to get the right, um, the right thing. What make the only thing that's kind of unique, like I said, the DTSX Pro over Adobe Atmos is it is that center height speaker and that top surround speaker. Those are kind of unique to um, to uh, DTSX over over Adobe Atmos. Now, um, so I always bring up that picture because people actually see that. Now, if you have IMAX content, let's go back to the IMAX content thing again. Um, we get asked about IMAX content. If the, the IMAX content has a flag on it, and if the receiver recognizes it, it will tell you that it is actually applying the IMAX uh, processing to the, uh, the information. And uh, IMAX, so basically you do your Odyssey setup, you give the receiver a foundation. Um, DTSX Pro uses that foundation, and then when it sees a, the IMAX flag, it will make adjustments to its equalization and its base management to give you the impact that you would get from an IMAX theater. And it has to do that because remember, those speakers are gigantic and you're trying to get that impact uh, of that IMAX content. The content is, has less compression. It's more dynamic. The, the channels play full range. A lot of times the mixes are a little bit more aggressive and you want that experience and the receiver will um, modify its parameters when it sees that flag to give you as much of that experience as possible in your home. Okay, so that's something that's um, that I always want to that I always want to bring up. Mm -hmm. Just one more comment, you know. So this whole IMAX thing is, if you like IMAX movies in the theater, then you'd like to have this IMAX mode at home. One of mm -hmm. the constraints is is big speakers or or full range speakers, uh, mm -hmm. at least in your bad mix. Um, because that's how IMAX movies are mixed. They assume full range. Now, of course, we don't expect everybody to have all the way down a subwoofer. So, so the mix is made such that um, the low end frequencies as well as LFE effects go into LFE speakers, which as you heard late, earlier, IMAX doesn't actually have LFE speakers because they just render in all those speakers. So we extend the bass range down. So, you know, when you get an IMAX AVR, we we also recommend you know that you have high quality full range speakers but if you don't <laughs> then you can override the imax settings as well and i'm not sure uh phil if you're you're going to show that little yeah, menus yeah. that you have but the point is if if you have full range speakers you know when the imax content comes in there's a flag in our in our in our bitstream the avr sees that says oh this is imax content clink goes into imax mode sets the the uh, crossover points or special place does a little bit extra things on the base mm -hmm. um call that secret sauce if you want mm -hmm. uh, and then uh but if your room it doesn't work out or you use smaller speakers there's this was like the default for you but you can go and retune it it's also mm -hmm. very important that you did run odyssey at first so because it assumes a, a flat room response and that's what odyssey kind of does for you right it equalizes out even those little speakers and so they may just work but if they don't mm -hmm. you can override it Exactly. So one thing that we want to talk about is the fact that the um, that base management is applied for IMAX Enhance, and a lot of and that's good because it helps protect your speakers from being abused by the IMAX content. But you may have speakers that are that can handle um, that type of bass response. Like for example, um, Jim's favorite. Jim loves his BP 9080s with the big subwoofers built in, and those speakers can play a little bit lower than 70. So um, you want to be have the ability to make those adjustments. Now, in our receivers, this is actually what I'm bringing up right now is the um, the online um, all of our receivers you can control from the the network. So this is my um, AV8805, and I'm actually running a piece of of actually IMAX content on the on the receiver right now. So you could actually so you can actually see it running right there. I'm actually running IMAX. And when I'm running IMAX content, I can actually 
um, it actually brings up a hidden menu. So if you look in this menu right now, you'll see that it has IMAX um, settings in it. Well, those IMAX settings are not visible if you're not running a piece of IMAX content. So it says if you're not running IMAX content, you don't need to access these menu settings. But if you are running IMAX content, you should be able to make um, adjustments. So what I can do in here is when it's set to auto, um, the uh, whenever IMAX is sensed, all of the high pass filters for speakers the uh, for uh, are switched to are switched to 70. Now, if your speakers are small and you have your crossovers at 100, they'll stay at 100. But if you're um, but if you have like a full range set of speakers, it'll 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 uh, it'll default to 70. Now, if I go in here and I turn go to audio settings and I set it to manual, I actually have the ability to adjust um, the high pass filters and the low pass filters um, to drive my speakers a little lower um, in uh, in my room. So you do have the ability if you have if you truly believe your speakers are full range or could could handle the bass, you can play with the settings and adjust it. Um, when we first launched it at CES, we ran the default settings, and we were doing uh, these space shuttle launches right here. We were doing this space shuttle launch, and Jim was like, "Yeah!" And he loved it because the it was the, the no one said there wasn't enough bass because of the default bass settings. Believe me, they are they make sure the bass is great. So, so that's something not that not they not absolutely. You know, that's very true, and I don't know. You know, we don't get to do as many um, demos anymore, but every time I've done a demo, meaning literally built, you know, on the show floor, like at CES or at Cedia or various shows I've done in um, Tokyo and, and China, um, we run Odyssey mm -hmm. and we're done. We use exactly. you know, full range speakers. We really didn't have to mess with it at all, ever. Mm -hmm. And then one time I, I ran a demo and and uh, the big speakers didn't come for the rear, so we had to use the Timber Match, the same brand, little speakers. Mm -hmm. um, and we just played a little bit with the with the crossover points for those rear speakers to help them a little bit. But basically, yeah. it is it is quite nice. It, it works. Okay. So there's two things or two tips you want to give these guys, and then we'll um, for those people that are gonna have to leave in about at, at that hour time mark, and then we'll do Q and A. Um, the first thing, as Glenn says, and as Jim preaches. Uh, and runs around with a battle with, with his flag, uh, make sure that you use the Odyssey and do multi-point Odyssey measurements, okay? Measure multiple positions. The more positions you measure, um, the better the receiver can understand your room condition, frequency response, off-axis performance of your speakers to give you better performance. The That Odyssey information is used by the receiver to in order to give you the best quality possible. So if you look at these drawings, and the best way you can explain it, if I go back here to one of these drawings here, like this 7.1.4 uh, drawing, if you look at the um, DTS one, it's it's uh, the speakers are placed the optimum position. This isn't the only place you can put speakers. This is kind of the optimum place that you can put them, where everything is equal distant from you. Now. What happens with Od with Odyssey is it it figures out exactly where that speaker is located. So if that speaker is a little bit further away, uh, if the left right if the left um, rear speaker is a little further away, it f will fire that one off earlier so it arrives at the proper time. If it's a little closer, it'll delay that speaker so it fire it arrives at the proper time. So once Odyssey gives them um, helps the re the renderer determine what the baselines are, the two will modify the signal so the sounds come from where they should come from at the times they should come from. So you have to, if you want good performance, you gotta run good Odyssey. You gotta run multi-point Odyssey and then apply and then you give the, the uh, surround sound formats a a a, a better basis. Oh, this drawing too, by the way, is kind of deceiving. Um, if you look at the numbers, the only reason why they look different is uh, Adobe Atmos always likes to show the couch push further towards the rears, but it also, but if, uh, but if you look at their numbers or for angles, they they have these big vari variations. If I push that couch to the center of the room, the numbers get very similar to the numbers that you see on the DTS. It's just so a lot of times it's just the drawing and who drew it that determines that. But 
If you do Odyssey, you're going to get great performance from your Adobe Atmos and your DTSX and your DTSX Pro. So, so please do your Odyssey. Yeah. Uh, and before we go, actually, Jim, did, uh, you want to talk a little bit about the app because you love this guy. You use it. You 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 made me a believer of this app instead of using the internal the receiver's internal process or do the measurements. You want to talk a little about the app real quick? Sure. Uh, so we do have an app. It's called the Odyssey Malt EQ, letter E, letter Q, editor app. It's $20 US on the iOS or the Android website. You still use the microphone plugged into the AVR or the pre-pro. So you still do that. And the your device doesn't do the measuring. It gets the information from the AVR, and it does all of the computing. In addition to doing all of the computing, it also gives you toys, if you will, to play with. Like a multi-band EQ where you select the bands, as you can see in those two left pictures there. And you can do that by location. So you can do the fronts as a pair, and then you can do the center, and you can do the surrounds, et cetera. On the far right, you can actually see the before and after. So there's what we listened to before we did Odyssey, and there's what it sounds like after. Now that, that and you do that by individual speaker location. That lower right picture is from a, one of the subwoofers in a system, an actual uh, system. Mm -hmm. And you can see how jagged the green line is. That's before optimization. Mm -hmm. That's not a great bass listening experience. The one on the right is an unbelievably good bass listening experience. So why not let it do that for you? Yeah. Now, there are people that will tell you that they don't wanna equalize their speakers. They love how they sound. That's why they bought them. They love how they sound in their room and they don't wanna do that. Well, just like with the others, in those center two pictures, we have the multi q filter frequency range and that dotted line on the top image, top center image to the right, you can slide to the left and it will apply equalization to all of the frequencies below wherever that line winds up. So in the center lower image or center bottom image, that one is at 199 Hertz. That's just where it wound up. So now it's equalizing the base, which is the biggest problem to get right in a room and leaving all the other frequencies alone. Mm -hmm. And for some people that's important. For me, it's critical mm -hmm. because with my job and the fact that we own two different speaker brands, I have speakers going in and out all the time, and I really need to know how they sound in my room without anything done to them compared to how the previous one sounded. So mm -hmm. I, I really, really like that particular feature. Yeah. So this app, the app is 20 bucks available in the Google store and the Apple store. If you're, if you want to optimize and get the most out of your surround sound performance from like a DTSX system or a DTSX Pro or anything that's playing on one of our dedicated Marantz receivers, make sure that you use it. The last thing that I want to talk about is um, the importance of eARC. You hear audio return channel ARC um, and eARC is becoming, is going to become more and more important. Um, Nate mentioned that uh, like companies like Sony are going to be launching um, more IMAX enhanced movies. And a lot of us are getting our content from the TV's internal streaming services. And the um, uh, if you want DTSX or DTSX Pro, um, you need to use, Glenn, which one? ARC or eARC? Which one do they have to use? eARC, eARC, enhanced. E okay, e why, do they have version of so why do they have to use the enhance? Why is DTSX and DTSX Pro only available um, via eARC instead of just regular audio return channel? Because we want to maintain the audio resolution and bit rates that you get them natively. If you go to ARC, ARC is uh, ARC and SP GIF. So some some people will use the optical that's called SP GIF. And ARC, those are exactly the same thing and exactly the same protocol. 
they're bandwidth constrained to 1.5 megabits per second. So you cannot uh, put our um, DTSX or DTSX Pro codec resolution over 1.5 megabits per second. So mm -hmm. what we do is we will actually turn that into our digital surround, mm -hmm. um, which gives you a better for for only five channels, so you get a better audio bit rate, so you get mm -hmm. um, near lossless kind of quality, mm -hmm. and then you will adapt mix it using Neural X. But mm -hmm. if you want to maintain the actual mix as intended from the streaming service, then you will want to have an eARC connection. So you want to have a TV and an AVR that both have eARC, and then an eARC should be easier to use than ARC if people have, a lot of people have used SPDIF just because Mm -hmm. understanding user menus but eARC they went to a lot of work to mm -hmm. to make it a little bit more automatic so. yeah because eARC now has audio return channel i mean audio return channel eARC now has auto lip sync so it gets rid of that problem it's yes, less that's good. it has it doesn't have it doesn't have it, it's uh it has more bandwidth capabilities so they don't have to worry about the compression things are ran at the set at the uh at the um with the it's the same quality as a 4k ultra hd blu-ray um, that goes down that line. So um, DTS has always been about the highest quality. And even when it first came out, that was one of the, the main selling points was less compression compared to the other surround sound formats that were available. And they are, and you guys are very stick, you guys are sticklers about your quality. And while you could pass compressed immersive, um, because some companies do that, it, it, it isn't, um, you guys aren't willing to make that compromise. Yeah, so, you're talking about on the on the arc. Um, yeah, exactly. Because there, the there are some. Uh, yeah, there are. Yeah. Some, yeah. They'll, they'll compress all the channels down into that 1.5 megabit. Exactly. So for this to be blunt, Dolby Atmos can be played back um, using Dolby Digi Dolby Digital Plus via arc, which is a uh, um, and. Um, but that requires a large amount of compression and DTS did not want to do that. So you need eARC. Now, all of our receivers for the past several years, like three years, are compatible with eARC. And most new TVs that you're buying over, since um, my TV is a, is a year or so old and it definitely has eARC already. And most new TVs you're going to be buying this year are going to have eARC. So eARC is, if you want to make sure that you want to take advantage of the maximum that um, that that internal app can do, or say you're you have a game system and you plug the game system in, and that game system has um, uh, a, a service on it that has um, uh, DTSX Pro in order to get that signal from that game system plugged into the TV back to the receiver. You got to make sure the receiver and the TV support ER. Yeah, even the games may exactly. use. DTSX, exactly. and, and so you'll, and you know, the gamers will hook the uh, game to the TV directly because they're worried about latency, but they still have an AVR because some people go, well, why don't you just go through the AVR? No, don't talk to a gamer. <laughs> they want that, exactly. they want that direct connection to the TV. Yeah. So then the audio will go eARC, and because of the eARC uh, synchronization, they also get a good performance um, on the audio track coming to the AVR. Uh, not being exactly. being delayed too much, which is important exactly. to the gamers as well. Exactly. So I did. So I want to get that point across. Use eARC when you can. Buy a receive. Make sure if you, you should all of our all of our receivers support it. support it. Make sure if you're going to get a new TV that that supports it. Um, so you make sure that you're set up for the future and use the Odyssey. Make sure you subscribe to the Sound United YouTube channel because we cover a lot of material there and we have one whole video on setting up speakers and immersive surround sound. Nate, do you get to go back into your house now? Well, yes. TBD, I'll let you guys know how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, everybody gets to go to bed. So um, thank you guys again for coming. I'm, I'm gonna play thanks. video games. <laughs> yeah, so thanks Frederick, <laughs> thanks, thanks Jen. Thanks Jim for being a soldier and we will talk to you guys soon.